started uh, missionlocal.org. Uh, this is almost entirely uh, operated through donations from, from as, as, as PBS would say, viewers like you. Uh, so please go, and uh, if you like what you're hearing, please uh, don't hesitate to donate. Uh, Ryan, I called around, and the number one question from a vast array of city politicals, lawyers, cops, and others is, how do you pronounce your name? <laughs> Great question, Joe. It's Ryan Kojaste. Kojaste. Yes. Okay. And as I often ask people before these events, who are you and what do you do for a living? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming. I really appreciate Veronica and everyone from Manny's for hosting us in this space, and I'm really grateful to you, Joe. I think you're an excellent journalist. I've read your work for many years, and it's really surreal to be here at Manny speaking. So my name is Ryan Kojaste. I am a prosecutor. I worked in the San Francisco DA's office. I currently work in the Alameda County DA's office. And I am running for San Francisco District Attorney this November because there's a better way to achieve public safety. And I think we're in a inflection point in our city where we have people playing politics at the expense of evidence-based policies, at the expense of honest conversations. We're not collaborating, but we're pointing fingers. And so I've decided to step up and run against the person that used to be my boss, hopefully to have a spirited campaign and talk about the important issues that are actually going to bring about safety for all of San Francisco. And uh, uh, can everybody hear everybody? Uh, I'm making sure to talk into the microphone, but you could probably yell. Yeah. But uh, now you've cut your hair, and you're wearing the Clark Kent glasses, uh, <laughs> but you're not fooling anybody. Uh, you're 30 years old. Uh, this shirt and tie are older than you, Ryan. Uh, being DA, DA involves more than just criminal justice policy. It also requires managing a very large office, and I'm going to guess that uh, prosecutor's office has more challenging employees to wrangle than most. Please explain to us how, at 30, uh, you would do this. Yeah. Well, I'm actually really proud that I'm 30 years old. I think it's a big positive. We are at a time where I think the next generation of leadership should have a seat at the table. And I have been a career prosecutor. I actually come into this job having more prosecutorial experience than many other people who run for the job and have won. And so I actually have, I think, a very impressive amount of government experience. I was a commissioner of immigrant rights for the city and county of San Francisco for six years. I was appointed three times by the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, and we were tasked with working on overseeing a city department. And so, Learning the bureaucracy of the city, I think, was really valuable. And then also as a prosecutor, when you're responsible for a case, you're actually, in a way, managing every dynamic of the case. You are telling your investigators what to do. You're working with the police and telling sergeants what they need to do. You're also working with staff and paralegals. And so you're kind of like the boss of a case. And I think that really translates to being the head of a department because I'm an insider coming into this office. There's so many people, my friends, my mentors, who work in the DA's office, I understand what has worked and what hasn't worked under different administrations. And so I recognize my job as department head. I need to support my staff. I need to treat them with respect. I need to make sure they're not burnt out so we can competently prosecute cases. And under the current DA, 100 people have left the office. That's a staggering number. Why is that? Because people don't feel respected. There is so much politics going on that people are leaving, and the caseloads are too high. And when caseloads are high, you can't competently prosecute everything on your caseload. And when that happens, if a case falls through the cracks, someone dangerous can walk free and hurt somebody again. And so I've learned these lessons working in different DA's offices, and I want to bring that perspective to this job as the next DA. Now, what is a progressive prosecutor, and are you one? It's a great question, Joe. Uh, I want to take apart the word progressive for a second. In the word is progress. And since when is San Francisco against progress? I think right now it's such a toxic time in our politics where people want to use labels as a way to alienate and divide. I really want this campaign to transcend the label of progressive, of moderate, of conservative, because we need to be effective. And so this November, is gonna be an election between progress and regress. And Brooke Jenkins is exploiting our fear, is exploiting our concerns about public safety to drag us back into failed policies of the past, which aren't working. Whereas for me, I come from a family that's been affected by violent crime. And my family has had these painful experiences. 
and I want to channel this pain into progress for our city so this never happens again. And instead of playing politics, if you want to call me a progressive, a moderate, or conservative, it shouldn't matter because we need to be effective, we need to work with everybody, and we have to recognize job number one is public safety. And I don't think that's what we're getting here in San Francisco. Now, what would be your message to people who are concerned that quote unquote progressive approaches to prosecution are deleterious to public safety? It's a great question, Joe. I think we need to frame public safety in, in terms of what works. What does the evidence show us? What does the science show us? San Francisco is a hub of technology, of industry, but for some reason when it comes to public safety, we're not following the science. The war on drugs doesn't work, and it won't work again. Charging kids as adults to put them into prison doesn't work and won't work again. And fueling mass incarceration when we could also pursue treatment doesn't work and won't work again. Yet that's what we're doing here in the city. So what I have to say is that Data, science, studies show that certain policies are more effective than things we've tried. Because if mass incarceration on its own worked, we would be the safest country in the world. Now, I want to tell you a quick story. And when I come to court as a prosecutor and I get a case, the first thing I do besides looking at the charges is I look at the rap sheet of the individual. The vast majority of these people who commit violent crime came into the juvenile justice system. They committed crimes and crimes and crimes. They became adults, started with low-level property crime, and continued to escalate until now they've stabbed somebody or shot somebody or broken into someone's house with a gun. If we had intervened in a meaningful way when they were kids coming into the juvenile justice system, we would have prevented 30 future crimes, 30 future victims. And so I think communications is super important, Joe. Job number one is public safety. And I come into this role as a district attorney understanding we all deserve safe streets, safe communities, safe neighborhoods, but how do we get there? And it requires a balance of accountability and incarceration with rehabilitation and treatment. If we can strike that right balance, we can save lives and invest in our communities through the success of people to get them back on track, and we're preventing so many future crimes and future victims from existing. So what is the, the metric of success it used to always be, you know, uh, conviction rate. Mm -hmm. What is the metric of success now, and what is the metric that we look to for safety? Right. So, you know, I, I first started in politics working for Congressman Mike Honda uh, down in the South Bay. And when I had a conversation with him when I wanted to run for DA, he said, we all have the wrong priorities. He was a school teacher, he was a school board member, he was in the state assembly, he was chair of the public safety committee, then he was a longtime member of Congress. He said the metric of your success is when you ask for less funding because there's less cases. You have less repeat offenders. You want to work yourself out of a job. So when I think about it, when someone has committed a crime time and time again comes back into the criminal justice system, all of us have failed. Because we could have helped this person. We could have stopped the revolving door in and out of county jail. So that's what I think about when it comes to progress, Joe. When I don't have to ask the mayor for millions and millions and millions of more dollars, but we can redirect that ultimately, because we have less cases, into public education, into community-based organizations, into residential treatment. It's going to take a long time. And back to the question of me being young, I have nowhere to go. I'm going to be here for a while, and I can be the DA of San Francisco for a very long time to help stabilize and right the ship. Because in the last five years, we've had four different district attorneys. And so I think me being here for a long time and hopefully earning the support and trust of the voters, we can look at these metrics and we'll actually have time to see whether or not these programs are successful. Now, you, you were, were you a public defender or just worked in the office? So I was a volunteer attorney with the public defender's office right out of law school. So I think it's kind of unfair what the way it works nowadays because jobs are so competitive is government agencies actually require you to work for free to get experience. And so imagine coming out of law school, just a bar, you have all this debt, and now you want to do public service, but you have to work for free to show that you can do the job. And so I was very lucky to get an opportunity with the public defender's office. I actually wanted to be in the district attorney's office, but since I graduated law school early and took the bar early, they didn't have an op a program to start in the winter. So I naturally ended up across the street at the public defender's office because I wanted to be involved in the criminal justice system. 
I worked on bail reform and non-financial conditions of release. I spent hours in the jails understanding why somebody ended up where they are now. And then when I passed the bar, I was given the opportunity to be a misdemeanor trial attorney. So I took seven cases to jury trial and I secured a number of acquittals and I beat the prosecutors that I ended up then working with. And I think that made me a better prosecutor, trying to understand the strength of a case, why people get involved and end up doing you know, criminal behavior, and ultimately, how can we use the power of the district attorney's office to stop repeat offenders from continuing to commit crime, and how can we get people connected to success? And so I got to work with service providers, Joe. I got to work with the courts. I got to work with social workers. And I learned a lot about how San Francisco was really failing a lot of people. Now, you were hired by Jason Boudin, and, and you were fired by Brooke Jenkins, and then you were hired again by Pamela Price. And to anyone who would see the, the hirings as a negative and the firings as a positive, how would you argue the contrary? It's <laughs> also a really good question. So because of how political the DA's office has become, I end up just kind of floating around, and I didn't want it to be that way. So you know, I had expressed to Chesa that I had always wanted to be a prosecutor. In fact, in college, I interned for the Santa Clara District Attorney's Office. Because of my family background, I lost my uncle to gun violence uh, by two kids with guns and gangs. And I knew that I always wanted to make sure kids got on a better path. And so when Chesa was elected district attorney, I wanted to work with kids at juvenile hall. And I was his first hire working on implementing reforms to get kids back on track. Ultimately, I was promoted to violent felonies where I worked at the Hall of Justice. When Brooke Jenkins was appointed the district attorney, and I was unhappy with that choice, I'll be very honest with you, the mayor, I think, made a mistake. This was a time to unify our city during a tumultuous recall to pick a non-political manager to stabilize the district attorney's office. When that didn't happen, when she picked a political ally, I was willing to work with Brooke Jenkins. In fact, the last email I ever sent as an assistant district attorney was 12.30 at night. I was working on what would be the last day I was ever in court prosecuting cases. I reached out to the appointed DA Jenkins. I said, this is who I am. I really want to let you know that my unit in general felonies is struggling. We have few attorneys, we have too many cases, and we're not able to competently uh, prosecute. And so I would love to meet with you to talk about how do we strengthen our unit so we have more attorneys. Then two days later, when I'm at vacation with my family at a wedding, never met her before, she never responded to that email, she called me and fired me from my job. And so I, I don't know why, frankly. I was never given a reason. The only thing I can think about is I wrote an article before Jenkins was even appointed asking the mayor to continue the juvenile justice programs that worked, that I helped implement in San Francisco, that got kids back on track, that got them graduated, that got them into jobs or into city college, and they were successful. And so I never wanted to leave the San Francisco DA's office, Joe. It wasn't up to me. And so I needed a job. You know, I live in a rent-controlled apartment in the Richmond that I did not want to give up. So I worked very hard to get a job, and I got many different offers, frankly, across the country. I was committed to being a prosecutor. I only applied to prosecutor jobs. But then Pamela Price was elected and offered me an opportunity to work close to home and still live in my apartment. I wasn't gonna say no. I wasn't in a position to really pick and choose. This was naturally what was most convenient and I still wanted to continue prosecuting cases and serving the people of California. So it's not so much, I think, ideology, Joe, in terms of where I ended up where I wanted to be, but really, it's my family background. I always wanted to be a prosecutor, and I took the opportunities where I could be one. Well, let's talk a bit about your legal philosophy, and also uh, point out where you are the same or different than, than your uh, district attorneys that you've worked under. Uh, you mentioned uh, the tragedy with gun violence. Do you believe in enhancements? And do you believe in them at all? And uh, if so, when are they a useful tool? Yeah, so that's also a great question. So enhancements to a case basically ensures an automatic prison sentence. It increases the years of exposure that someone has when they commit a crime. Certain enhancements can be for using the, a gun in a commission of a felony. It can be great bodily injury. If somebody assaults somebody, and they don't have an injury as opposed to someone gets assaulted and they have paralysis, that's a different crime and you can add an enhancement. And I have used enhancements in San Francisco. I think it's a case by case basis. I don't really believe in a lot of blanket policies because the world isn't black and white. 
right? There's so much nuance. It's, there's a lot of gray areas. And so when I look at a case, I understand the harm done to the victim. I have to understand what does accountability and public safety look like. And if somebody is severely injured, I'm going to add the enhancement because I think charges should reflect the conduct. And so my stance on enhancements, Joe, is I've used them in the past. I'm open to using them, but they should be thoughtfully done. They shouldn't just be used to overcharge to ensure someone goes to prison, but we can be, I think, use our discretion wisely as opposed to just politically to show that look at what we're doing. And you've kind of partially answered this question, but mm -hmm. uh, can you parse your approach on status enhancements versus conduct enhancements? And, and, and uh, I, actually, I'll let you explain it because you're the lawyer. But, but sure. Yeah. So an example of a status, status enhancement is if you're in a gang. You know, gang enhancements have been used for, for decades that have disproportionately criminalized and incarcerated association of people from black and brown communities. I do not agree with gang enhancements. So my office will continue the philosophy that we're not going to continue these disparities that exist that put more black and brown people into custody based on who their friends might be. In fact, I think they're also very complicated to prove and a lot of that can have a lot of biases involved. But when it comes to conduct enhancements, I'm open to them. Again, great bodily injury, the commission, uh, uh, using a gun during a commission of a crime, I'm open to that. So I think, again, it needs to be thoughtfully done when it comes to recognizing, again, the harm that the criminal legal system has caused for different communities, but also how can we also make sure there's accountability for certain crimes. Now, specifically on gang enhancements, a former prosecutor asked about not using them to uh, met out disproportionate punishment, but uh, for an evidentiary advantage, such as being able to tie a shot caller to uh, young people that he sent out on, on, a, on a crime. Is that something you would be open to, or is it, or is it not? I mean, again, I have a general disdain for gang enhancements, but as I mentioned before, I think blanket policies can be irresponsible, and we should always be open to seeing if that's gonna ensure accountability for a heinous crime, we should be open to doing so, right? I think that should be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis by the managers in the office. So I'm not gonna say no, I'm not gonna say yes, it's just it's open, because it depends on the kind of case that we get. And correct me if I'm wrong, this is a differentiation from, uh, from the man who hired you. It is a bit of a differentiation, but I think the, the spirit of it is the same, right? But again, I recognize that my job is to prove cases in court. That is the job of district attorney. And if I have to pursue that, well, that can be a conversation at that time. Tell me a little bit about uh, your stance on when we should detain people versus releasing them on, on their own recognizance, and also when should we be diverting versus incarcerating? That's a loaded question, Joe. <laughs> I'm not trying to break that down in a few different ways. So, you know, I started uh, in the public defender's office working on bail reform because I recognize that the criminal justice system has really criminalized po poverty. There are people who couldn't afford to post their bond and they're ending up in jail pre-trial, maybe losing their housing, having their kids go into the foster system, giving up their dogs or their cats to the shelter and getting euthanized. That destroys lives. And so we have to, by law, and judges have to consider non-financial conditions of release. And as prosecutors, you know, in San Francisco, I think even DA Jenkins ha has agreed with this, that we're gonna continue the spirit of seeking non-financial conditions of release and not asking for bail. But under the California Constitution, we can seek to have a judge deny bail outright, pre-trial detention up to trial. And there's really only two provisions where you can do that. It's California Constitution, Article 1, Section 12, it's certain very violent offenses, or Article 1, Section 28, which is Marcy's law, the California Victim Bill of Rights, that uh, allows it for the judge's discretion if disobeying court orders a threat to the victim. I have detained people, you know, I've asked judges to detain people pre-trial for incredibly violent offenses, where I, it was my duty under the Constitution, or for very, um, for very, certain individuals who continue to violate court orders. Let's say you have a drug dealer who was arrested and they're released with a stay away order. Don't go back to 7th and Market. Mm -hmm. But then they do it five more times. It's like, okay, well you're gonna be now, you, you, you had multiple chances, you are going to now be detained without bail. So I think the way to do this, Joe, is looking at, again, following the law. What were the charges? What is the conduct of the person? 
to protect the public. And again, the job of the district attorney is public safety. And if I have to protect the public and file a detention motion, which is the paperwork you file to ask a judge to deny bail, we will do so. And one thing I wanna tell you all right now in the DA's office, I got a lot of friends who work there and they're struggling because of such high caseloads, mismanagement, the wrong people are in charge, and they have too high of caseloads, they're not even able to file the right paperwork. Or in a lot of times they're told by your manager, just ask for a judge to deny bail on a case where it doesn't apply, or when they don't have the time to prepare an argument. And then the current DA, the mayor's handpicked DA, is going around blaming judges, saying, look at all these people they're releasing. How can you lose in court and have the audacity to blame the judiciary? I think that's frankly unacceptable, and that's why I care so much about supporting my staff, Joe. I want to make sure they have the bandwidth to make that good argument. So you need to ask for more money before you ask for less? Well, I think one of <laughs> that may be true, Joe, but I think right now in the DA's office too, there's a very top-heavy management structure. There's a lot of people in that office who are making 300,000 plus salaries, and nobody knows what they do. They're just allies of the district attorney. You could have three attorneys in court for the price of that one manager who does nothing. So we need to have a, the right priorities. I care about putting more attorneys, even if I have the same budget, more attorneys in the jobs like I have in court every day so we can do our jobs. What would be your approach to organized retail theft, which is a question that comes from old school DAs who said that wasn't the thing when they were prosecuting cases. How would you approach this? Yeah, I think there's a, a multifaceted approach here, and I think back on a case that I prosecuted a couple years ago. It was a man on parole who went to the mall, the mall that's now closing, uh, Westfield. Which one, yeah. <laughs> Westfield Mall downtown. And for a period of two months, he stole over $1,000 of merchandise from the same store until he was caught. Ultimately, Sergeant, who apprehended him, built the case, arrested him, asked him, why are you doing this? And he said, I do this because there's a fencing operation, meaning that they take the, the merchandise, they give it to someone else who sells the stolen goods for, for money. He was doing it to fuel his drug addiction. And this is someone we had detained without bail, in custody, he was on parole. He really caused a lot of harm uh, to the store. So when I think about organized retail theft, it's two things. The people who do it must be held accountable. But how do we prevent it from going on? is making sure that we understand why people engage in it in the first place. In this specific case, it was someone who was, whether it was coerced or encouraged or felt like it was his only way to fuel his drug addiction. And we have so many crimes that are taking place in our city because of unresolved mental illness, because of substance abuse disorder, because of poverty or housing instability. And I think we have a responsibility, even though these root causes aren't necessarily always within the purview of the DA's office, I have a responsibility to be involved at City Hall for budget negotiations, to advocate for investments into community, for more residential treatment programs, for more affordable housing, for investments into community-based organizations, because I know this makes us safer. If we're able to make those investments, it's gonna make us safer in the long term, because no one, I think, better understands why someone commits crime than a prosecutor or a public defender because they see it every single day. And I have both of those experiences, unlike the current DA. I've been in the jails, Joe, and I have put people in jail. And so I really want us to be responsible in San Francisco. We're trying to promote ideology and we're fueling this reactionary base at the expense of public safety to win votes as opposed to actually pushing forth the evidence-based policies that will make us safer. And so that's how I differ in the largest degree with Jenkins, is that I'm not gonna say what sounds good and not do what works. I'm gonna do what works. And I think it's gonna sound good too, so. How would your approach be different than, uh, than Brooke Jenkins on fentanyl? And, uh, is, is this approach working? It's a great question, Joe. I, um, I had a very close family member of mine. Um, I treated him like an uncle. He was <coughs> really someone dear to me, and I lost <coughs> him to drug overdose here in the Bay Area in 2019. And you know, I look at the people suffering on our streets, and I, I see his face, and I recognize that these are human beings, that we have 
let down. Right. Drug dealing is unacceptable, Joe. People who deal drugs, I think first time offense should be um, put into the community justice court that we have in the Tenderloin that works to get people into job opportunities, English as a second language, into housing. They should get that opportunity. But if you continue to sell drugs and you violate court orders, you'll go to jail. And you know, one of the last cases I prosecuted in San Francisco, I sentenced a fentanyl dealer to nine months in jail. And I recognize the importance of doing that if other uh, alternatives aren't viable or they're not amenable to it. But when it comes to our drug users, what Jenkins and the mayor are doing of just arresting drug users without any infrastructure, cycling them in and out of jail, is what's causing the highest amount of overdoses in the history of our city. There is actually people dying because of these irresponsible decisions. I do not think that it's responsible to criminalize drug usage in the way that we are. It's a public health crisis. And so as the next DA, if somebody commits a crime because of substance abuse disorder, we need to refer them to drug court when appropriate to get them the treatment they need so they don't come back. But if it's just you, uh, usage of drugs for, for, for their own you know, person and they're suffering from addiction, we need to get them housed. We need to get them treatment. We need to make sure that they're set up for success so they aren't dying on the streets of San Francisco. You know, three people a day are dying on the streets of our city. Criminalizing them hasn't worked. The war on drugs did not work. And we're doing it again. And it baffles me that we're just doing, right, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. But what are the results? The most deaths on, this, on our streets in history. And so again, my, my philosophy, drug dealers will be prosecuted. But drug users, it needs to be treated as a public health crisis. And that's not necessarily within the purview of the criminal justice system. Can you compel people into treatment? Can you compel people into services using your office? So, you know, for example, conservatorships are a, a civil proceeding. Um, when it comes to the DA's office, really, you can show tough love in a few different ways. You can offer a collaborative court, like drug court, for someone to go to, or they can go to jail. And I think in a lot of ways, that's almost like compelling them. You know, I've, I've prosecuted violent crime where a lot of times the people don't think they need help. And I can say, look, you know, you've committed a crime. Your choice is to go to jail for one year or to do six months in residential treatment. And the vast majority of those people chose treatment. But here is the biggest problem. There are no beds available. And so, so many of them just wait and wait and wait in jail. And at that point, their time of custody is almost up. So why are they gonna to go to a treatment program where they can just spend another month in jail and get out? So that's the systemic infrastructure failure in our city and why I think the DA's office needs to be involved in the budget advocacy where we need more beds for substance abuse, for mental health disorder. Otherwise, they're gonna rot. People are gonna rot in jail. They're not gonna get the help they need. And what happens when you're released from jail, Joe? 3 a.m. outside of the Hall of Justice, they just drop you off. Right. Right. Uh, what are you supposed to do? You're just gonna go and commit another crime. That makes us less safe. If we can have the right reentry programs, if we can have the right treatment, and somebody is set up for success, and they get rehabilitated, they get a job, they add to the tax base, that makes us safer. That's better for society. I don't know why we think that doing what we've done is what we need, because I look at the rap sheet, Joe, I get a sense of a time capsule. I can look 40 years back in someone's life and see it started when they were kids. Yeah. And I was fired from my job, honestly, what I believe, because I advocated for the continued juvenile justice programs that I helped start in San Francisco. That made us safer, and that's why now I think we're going to be less safe, because all these important entry-level things in the criminal justice system, the moment of intervention, have been dismantled. I got another loaded question, which is, how would you have handled the Banco Brown case? That's a great question, Joe. That case was really troubling to me. If, if all of you don't know that case, uh, there was a young uh, trans person who had walked into a Walgreens and allegedly took $14 worth of candy. And the Walgreens security guard, not a sworn peace officer, a security guard with a gun, shot and killed this person, Banco Brown. And D, the appointed DA Jenkins did not prosecute that case. 
one reason I think that didn't happen is a conflict of interest. The lawyer for Walgreens, who I used to work with, was the mentor of Brooke Jenkins. And I thought that was very troubling, and it wasn't uh, as covered widely by the media as it should have been. It was in Mission Global. It was, and no, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. But I think you know, that should have been a cause for concern for, for everybody. What I would have done, and what I have done as a prosecutor, is utilize the grand jury system. So as a prosecutor, there's two ways to prosecute somebody. You can file charges via just a complaint in court that's done by the prosecutor. If it's a felony, then you have to sort of prove the case in a preliminary hearing for a judge before it goes to trial. Or you can take a case to a grand jury. It's what our federal system uses because it's seen as less political. You take the case to a secret proceeding with you know, a jury of your peers and you ask them, is there enough here for a crime? Has probable cause been established for a crime? And I would do that with the Banco Brown case. The statute of limitations is still there if I become the next DA. I would take it to a grand jury. And what I really appreciate about a grand jury, I've done this for an attempted murder case. You are not only the judge, but you are the prosecutor and the defense attorney. You lay it all out there, the good facts, the bad facts, you rule on the evidence, and you ask the grand jury members, was a crime committed? And if they agree, you get an indictment. The indictment issues with the arrest warrant, they come into court, they're arraigned on the indictment, and it's set for trial. There's no preliminary hearing, there's less delays. It's what the Department of Justice does. And it's not used enough in our state, in our state courts. Mm -hmm. My policy is to use grand jury proceedings on controversial cases whether that's for police prosecutions, that's for the Banco Brown case, whether that's for corruption of an elected official, that I think we need to focus on special prosecutions like wage theft from big corporations. We need to take the politics out of the charges so people can trust in the veracity of the crime. Not, for example, to wait till the next administration comes in like Jenkins, who's dismissed every police shooting case in San Francisco. She wouldn't have been able to do that if it was an indictment. And so that's my policy, is I would take the Banco Brown case to a grand jury, as I would with a number of other high-profile decisions. So it's not seen as DA Ryan Kojaste bringing politics and, and going after these people. It's the grand jury, a community of our peers, have decided a crime was committed. Something I did notice Brooke Jenkins do is that she seems to have aligned herself with prosecutors like Orange County DA Todd Spitzer and Riverside DA Mike Hestron, uh, both Republicans, who have been charging fentanyl dealers with murder. Uh, is this a productive thing to do? <laughs> Honestly, I don't think Jenkins has secured a single conviction for that. She certainly so. talked it up. That's right. a possibility. Right. So and here's the thing, you those know, guys are actually making those charges. Right, they are. They are. And you know, one thing I do want to say that I appreciate about Todd Spitzer, even though he's a Republican, mm -hmm. is he was one of the authors for the Vic California Victim Bill of Rights. So I do appreciate his work on that. But I disagree with uh, charging fentanyl dealers with murder, just because I don't think it's easy to prove. I mean, our job as prosecutors is an ethical duty. You file charges on cases that you can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And when you're, for example, Jenkins, trying to, for example, talk tough, you'd be surprised that in the last two years she's been DA, over 2,000 cases have been dismissed, including over 1,000 felonies. Why does that happen? Because they couldn't prove the case. And that actually violates our ethical duties. It erodes trust in the system. You file charges you can prove, and you make sure you ensure accountability. And that's not what's going on. That's the politics that's being played with the office, and it harms people who are being charged, right? And so I think we can be responsible about this, Joe. I think we have a fentanyl epidemic in our state, in our country. It's very troubling, and people are dying. And we need to be working proactively with the Department of Justice, the Drug Enforcement Agency, on making sure we're going after these suppliers. And we really need to focus our efforts on going after these suppliers. What could your office do to quell the situation in the jails now? I mean, this seems to have been predictable. You mm -hmm. know, I've been talking to uh, inmates for years, and they told me that uh, if they take everyone from the tenderloin and put them in here, it's gonna be like the tenderloin in here. And that is what happened. Uh, that was predictable. Uh, what can your office do about this? What should your office do about this? Yeah, so uh, Mission Local did wonderful reporting on this recently. The sheriffs are really pissed off in our city. 
the jails are overcrowded, and that actually puts the safety of inmates and the sheriffs at risk. And this is what happens when we're making our jail a detox center by arresting drug users. And then what happens is without the care that they need, they'll sober up. Then when they're released and a few days later, they'll do the same dose they're accustomed to when they die. We have to stop that from happening. Jail as a detox center, jail as a mental health facility does not work. So what I would do, Joe, is I would focus on incarcerating those who pose public safety risks, those who pose flight risks. We can't just jail everybody, because now the sheriffs are really concerned, and so are the inmates. Again, this is what happens when you play politics. These are the repercussions. These are the ripple effects. When you're an irresponsible political actor, as opposed to a leader, you are causing harm, and that's just one example of what's going on. Another difficult question. Is the police department understaffed? That's a great question, Joe. Um, I think, frankly, from a lot of discussions I have, have had, that this number that they've created that's fully staffed is somewhat arbitrary, but I do recognize that we need more officers on our streets. The police department has a ton of money, right? A ton of money and they always get more. I want to make sure that money is used efficiently. Where is it going if it's not going to beat officers, right? I want community policing. I want there to be better response times. It's not what we have in San Francisco. Do I agree with giving military equipment to police departments? Probably not. I think that money can go into personnel, right? We need, I think, more officers. I became very close with a number of police captains working as a community liaison in the DA's office. I consider you know, at least one of them a good friend of mine. And you know, going to these meetings and understanding how hard of a job police officers have, I have a lot of respect for them. You know, I've seen a lot of really great police work in the city, and I've also seen some not so good police work. So I think we need better training, I think we need more officers, and we, we do have a problem. I mean, the biggest problem here is that the police are unable to identify people in a lot of property crimes. And when the public loses trust and the ability to apprehend someone, they're not gonna report crime. Businesses are gonna close. So I wanna to work to make sure how we can better clearance rates. Clearance rate is the rate at which the police can identify, apprehend, and arrest somebody. And so that's kind of low for a lot of cases, Joe. So I do think we need more beat officers. Does that mean giving the police more money? I don't know. I think we need to figure out where the money's going and how it can be used more efficiently. Well, how will you build bridges to law enforcement and specifically law enforcement unions? Yeah, that's a good question, Joe. So, you know, I, have worked with a lot of police officers. You know, I whenever I came to court and I was prosecuting a case, I thanked the police officer for their work. They're putting their lives in danger, right, going out there. And I always kept them up to date. I was transparent. Thank you for your work on this case. This is uh, the accountability that we secured. I also really care about the development of young officers. There were a lot of young officers who were on my, on my cases, first time they're ever in court testifying. And I de designated them as my investigating officer so they could sit with me and watch all of it. Because you can do that for an officer in court because typically they can't stay and watch their you know, colleagues testify. I wanted them to realize this is not you know, as scary as you may, may think it is. And so I've kept in touch with some of them. They were sad that I was fired. I recognize the importance of having a strong relationship with the police. If there are is tension, I can't do my job. I need them to make arrests and present me the case that I can prosecute. But at the same time, whether you're a police officer, a sheriff, a prosecutor, a government official, everyone can still be held accountable if they abuse their authority, if they break the law. And so you know, I come into this job, I don't wanna to seek to prosecute police officers, but if there is misconduct, you know, my office will investigate, and if there is a crime committed, we'll take it to a grand jury. But I believe in a healthy collaborative relationship whether it's with the law enforcement union, whether it's with officers or captains, they need to know that I appreciate their work, because again, I cannot do my job if they don't do theirs. Which we've seen. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, how would you prevent police from going out on a wildcat strike, which arguably is what happened to Jason Boudin? It is what, I, I think that it, that is true, that it did happen and it was concerning, but again, I'm, I learn from the lessons uh, and the mistakes made from those before me. I mean, that's what progress is. We see what worked, we see what didn't work, and that forms my perspective and how I want to lead in San Francisco. So, you know, one of the um, goals that I have for this campaign, I've already gone to some, I did in my capacity as an assistant district attorney, 
I want to go to every police captain's meeting. You know, I want to introduce myself to every police captain. I want them to know that all of us are a team. We want to save San Francisco. We want a fair and efficient administration of justice. We want to make sure people trust in law enforcement. If people don't trust us, if they don't find us credible, it makes us less safe because people are less willing to report crime. They're less willing to cooperate. And one thing I do want to say, Joe, that I think is really, really concerning is the attacks by Jenkins on the DA's office during the recall, the DA's office is not prosecuting. The attack she's had on, uh, on judges, judges are releasing people. It's making victims and witnesses not want to cooperate. That happened to me in the DA's office, it's happening to my colleagues right now, and you know what that does? If a victim or a witness feels like their time is wasted, if it's not gonna do anything, that attempted murderer, that rapist, that child molester walks free because we cannot prove that case. That's what's happening in San Francisco. So I think we have to do a lot of rehabilitation on our image as law enforcement, on our image on the DA's office, and make sure we're not eroding the trust in the criminal legal system and the judiciary. We all have to work together to make sure we have a safer city. We can't have somebody wanting to be a dictator and being mad when they can't win in court and then making sure that people are now more scared. She is exploiting our fear and our concerns to bring us back and it's wrong and I think that San Francisco deserves better. Now in the event you do win, how would you stave off the very real possibility of disgruntled wealthy people bankrolling an inevitable recall drive? <laughs> We have a recall madness in, in California, and it's really unfortunate. But at the end of the day, I think the best that I can do is continue to have events like these where I can build trust. Now, I'm a regular guy. I come into this job from a family tragedy, and I don't want that to happen to anybody else. I recognize job number one is public safety. And the best way to do that is to be transparent, accessible, and community-driven. I will work on having data in my office. You know, so many lawyers, and even myself, have asked for certain data in the DA's office, they refuse to provide it. Why? Because they probably know it looks bad. They don't want to track how many less people they're referring to treatment courts, how many cases have been dismissed, how many more cases they're losing at trial. And that's a problem. If people want to know I'm effective, I have to give them all the stats, all the data, be very honest about it. And so that's what I hope to do, Joe. I hope to be someone of integrity, to be ethical, to be competent, and also to let people know what I'm doing. And that means public safety town halls, that means opening my door to every journalist, even if they may not like me, and also having monthly reports with the data of what exactly is going on in my office. I will close with one very big question, which is how will we be safer with you as district attorney as opposed to the incumbent? Well, I mean, uh, I don't think people really feel safer in San Francisco right now. She promised us the world. She said, you put me or someone like me in office, we're not going to have storefront vacancies. We're not going to have violence. We're not going to have drug dealing. Things are getting worse, and people are losing faith in the system and no longer reporting it. How you all will be safer under my leadership is I'm going to bring together experts. I'm going to bring together police, prevention teams, community members, to understand that if we can strike the right balance between accountability and rehabilitation, get people the care and treatment they desperately need, they will commit less crime. Having less repeat offenders means we're safer. And also holding our government leaders accountable. I don't control the budget. I'm just one department head in a city of many different departments, but I want to play my part and be more proactive. Because look, the DA's office is a reactive department. A crime is committed, the harm has been done, then it comes to my desk to figure out what to do. But how can I work towards making sure the reasons people commit crime can be reduced and mitigated? And that's working closely with the Board of Supervisors, hopefully with the new mayor, and making sure that we have the right priorities in San Francisco and we're all working together, not pointing fingers. The last thing I'll say, Joe, is we have to seek solutions in San Francisco, not scapegoats. I have some questions here from the crowd. Let me ask a couple of those, but th those are my questions, and, uh, and thank you for sitting through those. Uh, it says, it seems that crime is broadly down across San Francisco. How would you continue this trend if elected? And who do you think is doing a better job, Brooke Jenkins or Pamela Price? Many different questions in that question. Uh, one thing I'll say is that I've talked to a lot of different business leaders in San Francisco, 
and a lot of people have had their cars broken into and they're not reporting crime. You know, they feel like the police aren't gonna respond, that nothing's gonna happen. And so, again, the crime being down in an election year and all that rhetoric I think is a bit disingenuous because the operative word here is reported. And also studies have been shown, I think the examiner had a good article a couple months ago, that there is a national trend of declining crime in the country, but it's less in San Francisco. Our rate of decline is a lot lower than other cities. And why is that? Because we're going back to failed policies. And so, again, crime itself, the very existence of crime is a problem. And it shows that as a society, we have not pushed forth the right policies to invest in people with good education, with good jobs, with housing opportunities, right? If we have those things, that's common sense. If someone is stabilized, they're not gonna commit a crime, right? But they are. So I think our city as a whole, as a state, as a country, we need to have an honest conversation. How are we gonna make sure that we have better schools and free higher education? How are we gonna make sure the cost of housing isn't as high? How are we gonna make sure everyone has health care and mental health care? How are we gonna make sure that people have opportunities for jobs, good union jobs? That's not the purview of the DA, but I believe I have a role to play in pushing forth these policies. So I think, frankly, all of us have failed because crime exists and we have bloated law enforcement budgets. And the best way to make us safer is to all work together and collaborate. So. And along some lines, it says, what are your thoughts on restorative justice and would you bring it back slash build on it here in San Francisco? Well, that's a good question. So under the last DA, San Francisco DA's office received a grant of $6.8 million for restorative justice. I have overseen a couple of restorative justice programs in San Francisco Juvenile Hall. They are incredibly effective for kids. And it puts them on a better path, it helps them accept responsibility, come face to face with the victim. Restorative justice only happens, right? It's sort of a diversion program where you can do programming and you can meet with the victim and learn about the harm done. It only happens if both the victim and the defendant or minor agree to it. It's, accept, it's so successful, in fact, that if a kid finishes restorative justice, they have a 66% less chance of committing another crime. Because Brooke Jenkins has halted all restorative justice programming in San Francisco, the funder who gave us $6.8 million took all the money back. And that's a problem. So again, restorative justice is something that requires the agreement of both victim and defendant. I've seen it be valuable with kids. I want to bring it back at juvenile hall. When it comes to adults, it should be a discussion on a case-by-case -case basis. But I think it can be valuable, but again, not for the most violent, serious, and repeat offenders, but where meaningful early intervention can pay massive dividends to get someone back on track. It says, since San Francisco has very little actual treatment, how can a DA affect change? That's a great question, and I think it comes down to just being proactive. You know, I believe the district attorney's office and the public defender's office should have satellite policy offices at City Hall. We should be working closely with supervisors, we should be involved with the mayor's office, we should be involved in budget advocacy to say, look, because we have s such a small amount of beds, we are unable in the criminal justice system to get people the help that they need. And that's a problem. So I can't right, write checks for, for providers to have beds but the mayor can. The mayor can engage in those contracts. The Board of Supervisors can also be involved in that process. And you know, the current DA doesn't have a good relationship with a lot of city leaders. In fact, some city leaders tell me they have had zero relationship with her. Whether you agree with me, whether you don't agree with me, whether you know, we fall on different you know, alliances, it's my job to transcend that, to have a good working relationship with everybody and tell them, you want a safer city? Here are the things that you have to fund because that's the way I can do my job better. It says, are you seeking the endorsement of former DA Chase Boudin? And which San Francisco politician do you most align with politically? Great questions. Uh, I have not sought the endorsement of Chase Boudin, although I did work with him, and I appreciate um, a lot of the things that he did for kids, most especially. I've certainly had conversations with him on how I cannot make some of the mistakes that he made, which is valuable and I appreciate those conversations. 
When it comes to who I align myself most in San Francisco politics, I would probably have to say someone that I admire so much, Mark Leno. He was one of my first endorsers. Him and I had a, first time I met him, we had a three hour conversation over hot chocolate in the Castro. I find him to be a bridge builder, a man of utmost integrity, someone who should have been the mayor of San Francisco in the 2018 election, he came very close. And I really look up to his example of someone positive, someone who works with people, and who recognizes that our love of San Francisco needs to bring us together, not divide us. So I you know, look up to him a lot. You know, he came to my campaign office opening a few days ago, met my family, and I really appreciate him. And I, and I aspire to be the kind of leader that builds consensus like he has. And I will close with what I think is uh, right up your wheelhouse here, which is what is your plan to prevent youth from resorting to a life of crime? That's a great question. Ending the school to prison pipeline by getting a kid the care, the mentorship, the services, the therapy, the extra extracurricular opportunities they need will stop crime. Uh, two young kids, you know, with a gun killed my uncle. And I always think about with, with my aunt in law, you know, my uncle's widow, why were these kids where they were with guns? How do we stop that from happening? Taking this pain and channeling that into progress. Making sure that we can save lives in the DA's office. And saving lives makes us safer. So I, I'm the only candidate for district attorney, perhaps ever, I'm not saying ever, maybe in the last like 40 years, right, that's ever worked in juvenile home. I understand these issues. I worked with kids for two years at the time of COVID, a considerable time of challenges, of struggles, of obstacles, and we still were able to work with them and they didn't come back. And as a prosecutor, you're kind of seen as you know, the enemy in court towards defendants and their families. But so many families thanked me after you know, a kid had their case dismissed because they did everything they needed, or they completed their treatment, or they were able to pay back the victim and not go to jail. And they were like, hey, they got accepted into college. They graduated from public school. They got a job. You know, we've never seen them you know, at this point. We're so happy. And I played a small role in that, right? And so that's the power of the DA's office. It's wielding our discretion, which is powerful, in the right way, recognizing what's going to make us safer, not just playing politics. Sure, it could sound good, let's lock them all up, but what are the results? If you get a kid who came in on a petty theft, back on track, you may prevent them from having a gun, getting themselves killed, or killing someone else 10 years later. And that's what it's all about. It's intervening, and it's balancing accountability and rehabilitation. And, and that's why I believe I'm, I'm really running for district attorney. There's a better way on public safety. That's what it is. And that's not what we're getting at San Francisco. Well, Ryan, thank you for coming out here on a Tuesday. Thanks to everyone who came out on a Tuesday. And don't forget, missionlocal.org. Please read our stuff. And uh, if you're so inclined, uh, don't uh, hesitate to leave a tip of both sorts. Thank you, you so much, much.